Hello, I'm Kamal Santamaria, and welcome to Rewind. Later this year, Al Jazeera English will be celebrating its 10th birthday. And to mark the occasion, we've chosen this suitably grand location, the Museum of Islamic Art here in Doha, for a backdrop, while we revisit and update the most memorable documentaries we've made for you in the past decade. Today, we're rewinding back to 2014 and the Philippines. The country was experiencing a spike in gun violence at the time, and the government's response was to introduce new restrictions on the purchase and possession of firearms. There had been a fierce backlash from the gun owner's community, which was insisting on the right of self-defense against escalating criminality. Against this background, Al Jazeera's 101 East series sent Steve Chow off to investigate the black market in guns in the Philippines and to find out whether the new laws were making any difference. In a while, we'll be hearing how things stand there today with a controversial new president committed to waging war on the narcotics trade. But first, here is the film, Stray Bullets. Every nine minutes, someone in the Philippines makes a deal to buy a gun. According to police statistics, within half an hour of that purchase, a crime is committed, and someone is murdered. In the Philippines, the murder rate per capita involving firearms is three times higher than the United States. I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we look at a new law the government says will put an end to gun crime. If so, critics ask, why haven't the killings stopped? On any given weekend, across the Philippines, you'll find shooting ranges packed with gun lovers. Through makeshift mazes, they battle to win the weekend's title of the fastest draw. The almost religious devotion to shooting in this nation reflects a deeply embedded gun culture. And while the right to bear arms isn't enshrined in the Constitution, like in the United States, many here believe it should be. Gun ownership is a civil right. This is Ernesto Tabuhara, the face of the pro-gun lobby. We believe that uh, we should have our freedom uh, to own and possess firearms. Maybe so, but others have suffered on the other end of the gun. From the moment she was born, Stephanie Nicole Ella was the life of her family. She had been hit by a stray bullet after someone fired into the air to celebrate the new year. Stephanie's bright light went out. Her father, Jay, remains devastated. He spends hours a week by her grave. When night comes and I need to get rest and sleep, those memories, bad memories, always come back to me. And what also remains is the pain of not knowing who's responsible for firing the gun that night. Police have yet to make an arrest. I always keep her alive in my heart. I always remembering those things. That makes me smile, even though no st still no justice for her. The public outcry over Stephanie's death, among dozens of others, forced the government in May of 2013 to revamp how it regulates guns. This is Louis Opus, the chief of the police firearms division. He takes us through a newly renovated office that will, for the first time in the Philippines, register gun owners by computer. Till now, the record keeping has been done by hand. Because of this, Opus believes 70% of all gun registrations to date were faked, making it almost impossible for police to track down owners of guns used in crimes. On my second day here in my office, I kicked out 16 people. 16 people. Yes. The straight-talking chief of firearms was only recently brought in, tasked with cleaning up a department long accused of taking bribes and for selling guns seized from crimes on the black market. We are now trying to introduce technology because when you introduce technology, you could lessen corruption. His other task is to put into practice a new gun law that includes much higher fees for gun ownership and more stringent drug and psychiatric tests of those who want to own them. I do believe that not everyone should have a firearm. In this country, 
it is not a right to have a gun. It is a privilege given to an individual to have this firearm. We go looking for a gun shop to find out how this new law is affecting business. With at least one in every major mall in the Philippines, they're easy to find. The display case of this store shows off a variety for sale. So this one has a laser sight. From high-powered handguns. Wow. To semi-automatic rifles. The gun industry pumps $60 million a year into the economy. How have gun sales been recently since the law was announced? Has it been affected? Yeah, has it been affected? Yes. How much? The owner admits sales are down. 50, a uh, half of the sale. Fifty percent? Yes. That much? Yes. But that sort of talk has the pro-gun community up in arms. So if you restrict uh, the rights of licensed gun owners to own and possess and carry a firearm, you're not solving the problem of criminality in the Philippines because these are not the people who are committing the crimes. If the new gun controls have any chance of succeeding, Opus agrees police will have to clear the streets of illegal firearms, especially in the country's many slums. We've come to Tondo in Manila. It's the most congested shanty town in the world, where people get by on a few cents a day by recycling garbage. Tondo is also one of the most dangerous places in the country. Gangs have carved out their own territories, and shootings happen daily. Well, we've arranged to meet members of a group known as the Temple Street Gang. They control some of the streets in here. The interesting part is that they don't consider themselves criminals, but a form of neighborhood watch. We navigate deep into the narrow warrens of Tondo, places where police rarely go, to find the group and its leaders. Hey, Jesse. Hi, I'm Steve. Jesse. Jesse, nice to meet you. Jesse Abello is one of the enforcers for the Temple Street Trece, or TST gang. Nice to meet you, How you doing? I'm Steve. He tells me he runs 20 men here. They're mostly boys. So Jesse, you say this whole area is yours. He shows off his patch. Started on the streets of LA, the TSD created a Philippines chapter sometime in the 1980s. Now they're battling rival gangs to see who will own Tondo. Jesse says he became a member of TST when he was 16. He's now 21. When I joined the gang, I felt a sense of solidarity. You have your group of friends who are true to you. It's a real fellowship you can count on. A fellowship he believes has kept him alive in what is a perilous place for young men. A few weeks earlier, local news channels headlined a shootout between two rival groups in the area. The back-and-forth battle was captured on security cameras. Show me your gun again. The group won't say if TST was involved, but Jesse shows us old bullet wounds from past fights. So you're shot here. I can see the bullet wound there. Exactly how he got oh, yeah, them, he won't here. say. The entry wound is here, and it came out, came out on the other side. Okay. You were in a gunfight, or what happened? I was just accused of something, and things just happened. Then. One of the gang returns with something to show us. It's a handgun. Oh, this is the gun. Can I see? It's an old one, but we're told it's been used to kill at least two people. Why do you need a gun? Why do you guys need guns? also have guns. Your enemies also have guns. Your enemies also have guns. So you need guns to protect yourself. Despite the tough talk, Jesse admits the fighting, the shootings, the killings have taken their toll. In the beginning, I said to myself, I wouldn't do certain things. That I joined the gang just for the friendships. But I feel I've since lost my way. These days, I'm the one looking for trouble. That guns are needed to survive here is something we hear again at our next stop in Tondo. We're met by orphans. They're thieves taught to steal guns by one of the area's dealers. Inside, we meet that dealer, who we'll call George. These guns are 38s. He shows us some of his current stock. How much do you sell this one for? 10,000. 10,000, about 250 US dollars. 
that. Up until a year ago, George was a painter. Then he lost his job and says he had no choice but to get into guns. He says he makes twice as much now. Do you ever feel guilty knowing you are selling weapons that could kill people? Not really. It's up to the buyers. Maybe it's for their protection. I don't care where or how they use it. The important thing is I sell the guns. And George has sold many of them, more than a hundred over the past year. He does so, he says, not only to feed the orphans, but also to support his own five children, one who's sick in hospital. Even though I know I could be caught, I can't entertain fear. One of my children is ill. I need money for medicine and for the surgeries. That's why I don't really care about the punishment. It's nothing for me. As for the new law, George says the poor can't afford the high fees to register guns. Besides, he says, people have little faith in police. It's impossible for this law to work. How many police actually look after civilians? Almost all cops are criminals in this neighborhood. If someone really wants to kill you, the police can't and won't protect you. Do you recognize, Superintendent, that one of the weaknesses traditionally for the Philippine National Police is enforcement? Yes, I agree with you. How do you overcome this problem? The Philippine National Police is trying to change, but we cannot change overnight. It will take time. But we are trying our best, and we have agreed, and we have admitted that there were faults, and we are trying to correct them. But in Tondo, change is not happening fast enough. We come across a wake. It's for Juventio Inad, a man who sold mangoes in the slum. He was known as a tender, gentle man. Still, he was shot and killed. Few stopped to look. Kids continue to play basketball nearby. With so many deaths here, another just doesn't mean that much. His wife, Luisa, and brother are left to grieve by themselves. Police have no suspects. And Luisa has left to wonder why he was killed. I don't know why he was shot. He didn't wrong anyone. He was just making a living. He didn't have enemies, unlike others I've heard of. Luisa hasn't heard of the new gun law and says she's rarely ever seen police patrol here. All she can think about now is how to earn enough to survive. In a quiet moment, she admits to being afraid. She's scared the killer will come after her next. Scared because she has nowhere to go. Virtually everywhere we turn in Tondo, we find victims of gun violence and little evidence of police action to stop it. Lolita, nice to meet you. When we meet Lolita, she's mourning the loss of her grandson. He was shot and killed a few weeks earlier, she says, by neighborhood thugs. I told police many times that these boys were threatening to kill him, but they just told me to call them when they're there. When I did, and by the time they got here, it was too late. Lolita says Rodelio, aged 17, had been bullied for years by the gang. They stole from him, attacked him, and then finally, one night, they shot him. He survived a few days in hospital, but the wounds were too serious. I miss him so much. He was my only helper. When I was sick, he was the one who would sell our smoked fish. He helped others too. He never caused problems, which is why those bullies picked on him. In this small, cramped room, Lolita cares for four other grandchildren. The gang knows she told police about them, and she now worries for their lives. My next oldest grandson is 14 years old, and they've said they'll get him next. I'm very uneasy now. I haven't recovered. And now they want my other grandson. I think uh, it is this kind of community that breeds more crime. Norman Cabrera has been lobbying for years for a total ban on guns among civilians. 
He says the high crime in the Philippines makes it necessary for such extreme measures. Besides, he argues, many other countries have such bans. Since we are in a, in a crisis, no? I think uh, there is a need for such harsh measures to be, to be put in place. Cabrera says the new gun law is a farce and imposes no limit on how many guns a person can own. It is uh, obvious no, that uh, this kind of policy is a policy that advances the interest of the politicians, the gun traders, the gun dealers, and uh, no one else. Cabrera points to the law's biggest supporter. The Philippines' president, Benigno Aquino, is an avid shooter and gun collector. He owns 18 firearms and is known to be against a total ban on guns. He's been quoted as saying, firing guns relieves his stress. Ladies and gentlemen, announcing the arrival of the president of the Republic of the Philippines, His Excellency Benigno S. Aquino III. We go to an awards ceremony, which the president is attending, to speak to him about better gun controls. For two months, we've been requesting an interview with him but have received no reply. After learning what we want to ask Aquino about... I have a press pass. Yeah, I know, but uh, they say that you cannot ask questions. His aides bar us from joining his press conference. Is he not willing to speak about gun laws? Is it too sensitive a question for him? As other media crews with approved questions are allowed through, the president's security detail blocks our way. Our producer and cameraman try to get into the press conference, but are told off. By the time we make it to the lobby, the media scrums over, and he's left. President Aquino's press staff knew the question we wanted to ask, and they were intent on stopping us from asking it. It shows how sensitive this issue is and how sensitive this issue is to President Aquino. To investigate claims, some Philippine authorities are actively supporting the illegal gun trade. We head for the mountains of Danao on the Philippine island of Cebu. It was here 600 years ago that Spanish conquistadors first colonized the Philippines, and some argue started the gun culture. Centuries later, and local gunsmiths still ply their trade here, albeit secretly. We leave the van to go on foot. There have been a number of police raids here over the past few months, and while there are literally dozens of gunsmiths in these hills, most people are wary about speaking with us. The only two that are willing or up this trail. Hi guys. Hey. We'll call these two men, June and Edward. They're brothers. Yeah. Long-time gunsmiths, they show us how they make their firearms, starting from basic scrap pieces of metal. Their tools are simple. And from the sawing to the drilling, we can see nothing is measured. It's all done by instinct. What they are exact about is where their profession stands in the eyes of the law. It's illegal. Illegal, they say, but that's not about to stop them. How can I sustain my family if I am not going to work with this? They put together their latest handgun and show me an array of others that are ready for market. It's a Colt Mark IV. Yeah, you know that gun. Yeah. The gun brands are faked. It says made in USA. Made in Danao. It's made in Danao. And they tell me, if I had a legal gun, they could make me a copy with the same serial numbers. So I'd have two guns, one legal, one illegal. Yeah. Well, the one original and the one imitation. The one original, the one <laughs> imitation. There June tells us his guns sell for as little as 50 US dollars. Together with his brother, they make about 50 a year. With so many workshops in these hills, that means thousands of new illegal guns enter the market from Danao every year. And, June adds, even with the new gun law, there's no shortage of buyers. Who are your customers? A lot of people want to buy this. A lot of politicians, police. Police? Military. Police and military buy your yeah. illegal guns. Yeah. 
and the politicians. Yeah, they just came and came and again to order. They come to order instead. Yeah. Morning. Opus says police are working to crack down on the sale of illegal firearms. He gives us one of the first glimpses for media of the vault where seized guns are stored. These are all the surrendered firearms. There are thousands. Confiscated, captured, surrendered, deposited, abandoned, forfeited firearms. Opus replaced the old cop responsible for guarding it with a new officer, admitting firearms have in the past mysteriously disappeared from these shelves. He now plans to digitally catalog each and every one to be eventually destroyed. You look at the issues that this country faces, corruption among the police force, a lack of trust in the police force, a lot of loose firearms. The problems seem overwhelming. How convinced are you that this law will succeed? I could feel what you feel, but people in this country don't want, want to have quick fix solutions. You really have to plan, coordinate, and enforce, and then you will see the effect. But not all have the luxury of time, especially the victims of gun crime. Lalita spends her days begging politicians and police to protect her surviving grandchildren. But her appeals, she says, have been met with few offers of support. And so she's left alone to deal with the threats worrying all the time who will be the next to be killed in a place where guns still rule the day. Stray bullets. Since that film first aired, gun violence has reached unprecedented levels in the Philippines, all in the name of the war on drugs. Indeed, back in May, a prominent member of the gun-owning community became leader of the country under that exact mandate. Since his election, President Rodrigo Duterte has launched a crackdown on drug pushers and users. He's been accused of ordering or encouraging thousands of extrajudicial killings by police and security forces. He's even suggested gun-owning Filipinos take the law into their own hands, a move critics say is just giving official sanction to vigilantes. Recently, Steve Chow returned to Manila for Rewind to see what's changed since Stray Bullets was first broadcast and President Duterte came to power. He caught up with an opponent of the new administration's get tough on crime policies. Rodrigo Duterte says he is trying to clean up the streets by waging a war on crime and drugs. How has that impacted gun violence? We've had so many incidents now, probably over 3,000 people being killed, most of them being killed by firearms. And what we're seeing is really justice being dispensed from the barrel of a gun. Overnight, the country has um, been transformed into a police state. And every day, you open the newspapers, you look at the news, and all you see are people being killed. But the president says that these are necessary steps to bring safety to the country. I don't agree with that. They will, in the end, lead to more chaos and anarchy, in my view, because you see, the Philippines has a weak legal system. We have very low conviction rates. Our, the, the police work that's being done is, in many cases, very shoddy. Our courts are congested. There's a lot of delay. And that's why people are so fed up with, with cri rampant crime and drugs and uh, corruption. But if the problem is a weak legal system, then taking the law into your own hands is just going to make that system weaker. And the weaker it gets, the more there will be a need to maintain order. And that order will only come from an authoritarian form of government. And that is really our, our concern. But perhaps if things are so messy, is a police state what the Philippines needs? Given our historical experience, I don't believe it is. You see, this government is running its government on a platform of fear. And that is unhealthy for any society, in my view. And even with so many deaths happening now, you still haven't seen any drug lords being captured or, or even killed. The, the people who are bearing the brunt of this war on drugs are really the poor. And we see that it's going to get just, they will keep feeling that and, and suffering that for as long as this war is ongoing. The president 
continues to argue that the root of all problems, especially crime, is rooted in drugs. How fair or how truthful is that for the Philippines? The, the key to holding people accountable and to putting criminals in jail is really to have a legal system that works, that can identify the criminals, apprehend them, bring them to court, and punish them after trial. For as long as that doesn't exist, there can be really no justice in the country. What we fear is that uh, that entire system, given the daily attacks on, on people and, and the lawless violence that's happening that is encouraged by the state, what we fear is that that system will collapse. And as I said, if that system collapses, then the only way to maintain order will be through a despotic authoritarian government. What has the president said in terms of any commitments to tackle gun violence? I haven't heard him mention that issue at all. And that is really of major concern. Even before he, he took over as president, there has already been a big issue about uh, gun violence in the country. Now that uh, he has issued statements saying that encouraging essentially people to use violence on criminals and on drug addicts and so forth, and we foresee that that's just going to get worse. How do you tackle gun violence in the Philippines when we're at this stage? I think the very first priority will have to be to look at our law enforcers, clean up the police forces, because they hold the key to any kind of investigation and identification of people who are involved in this type of thing. Unless and until you do that, if you give them this amount of power, you are going to find mistakes, you're going to find excesses, you're going to find abuse. And unfortunately, when the president took over, he, as far as we can see, did nothing to ensure that the police had the integrity that they need. These people who are now in our police forces are the very same people who were there before the president took over. Previously, they had restraints. They were restrained by you know, the, the, the regular government limitations on human rights, on uh, what they could do in terms of um, self-defense and protection of their own interests. But now all of that is, seems like it's gone down the drain. Essentially, now they decide who, is, who are criminals. They decide whether they should live or die. And no one is looking over their shoulders to ensure that um, they're doing the right thing. And the more they have that power, I, um, in my opinion, it's just going to corrupt them. You talk about things going down the drain. In 2013, when there was a lot of talk about stray bullets hitting innocent uh, people, especially children, and killing them, there was a bit of a tightening of restrictions on gun laws. Do you see all these steps sort of taking a backward sort of? Yes, I, I don't think that our law enforcement and the authorities in general have much interest in doing that now.